Good morning and welcome to the Church at the Beach. We continue our Advent series this week, The Glory of Christmas, with a man named Joseph. And as you see this story about Joseph, you will be blessed that he indeed understood his part in the Christmas story. I want you to listen to a famous hymn. In fact, a hymn voted as one of the top four hymns ever in the English language. Listen.
And we'll be looking at a message this morning that has to do with Joseph and his place and role in that particular happening. But first I want to take you back to the year 1739. How many of y'all remember 1739? Well, you may not know this, but uh, in 1739 there was a gentleman, a preacher, Anglican. Anglican father, Uh, and he was asked to write a Christmas hymn. He wrote, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Some of you may claim him in another heritage of Christian faith as a Methodist, because that was Charles Wesley. Charles Wesley found his hymn that had not really taken grip in place, edited by one of the greatest evangelists who ever lived, a part of Great Awakening in Western culture, George Whitfield, And he tweaked that hymn to give it its present-day lyrics, but it still did not catch on. Almost a hundred years later, As a gesture of Christmas and love for Christ, a German Jew who had been converted to Christianity wrote a cantata. And in the cantata, he gave Hark the Herald Angel Sings, as you sang it just a moment ago, its modern-day tune. He wrote it for Gutenberg, who wrote the press that made the Bible available for everyone to be able to read. What an amazing hymn. And how can you go wrong with Wesley Whitfield and Frederick Mendelssohn? Wow, what a great hymn. In fact, in 1872, it was voted one of the top four hymns ever written in the English language. Hark the Herald Angel Sing. It's about the birth of of Jesus. And the New Testament begins with the birth of Jesus. But it is a direct tribute to Christ. Listen to the words. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. Joyful, all ye nations rise. Join the triumph of the skies. In other words, join all those angels in this chorus with something that gives you internal peace in spite of outside circumstances. Joyful praise. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem according to prophecy, according to Scripture. Glory to the newborn king. Every stanza ends that way. Second verse. Christ by highest heaven adore. Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time behold him come. Offspring of the virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh. The Godhead see. Here's the trinity. Hail the incarnate deity. Pleased as man with man to dwell, Jesus, our Emmanuel, God with us. Hark the herald, angels sing, and again, glory to the newborn king. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. You know that title? You've seen banners in church? Hail the what? Son of righteousness. Life and light to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more die. That's your eternal blessing because of the coming of the Christ. Born to raise the sons of earth. 
born to give them. Second verse. Hark the herald, angels sing, glory to the newborn king. The glory of Christmas. That's what our Advent celebration is about. The lighting of the candles. Y'all did such a great job this morning. Thank you so much. Uh, and we've looked at hope and we've looked at peace. And all these things are the result of the coming of this Christ that we celebrate. Have you ever felt that way yourself? And clueless to what God has purpose for you in your life? Have you ever found yourself caught in doubt about what to do and about the fear in the doing of it? Joseph teaches us that you can trust God in the midst of doubt and fear. And if you'll do that, you have a promise. He'll never let you down. This morning, we go to God's Word to read about this very narrative that has just unfolded. Of course, the Scripture is going to be quite a bit different than the skit. So turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, as Matthew, after all of those begats, Kathy so well reminded us of that last week. Were any of y'all by chance at the early worship last week? We wish we had recorded it. But she got so flustered. That was the word I was looking for. She dropped her notes and she picked up the place where she was supposed to read. And then she started on the begats, realizing that she was supposed to read the text that I'm about to read. And then when we got through, she went and tried to light the candle, had already lit. I mean, it was something. So y'all, y'all are just in sync. I just want you to know. And you did far better than she and I did. I escorted her back over here and gladly went, <sighs> well, sometimes life's like that. I mean, we in church forget that when you read these narratives, they are occurring in the midst of real time. Though these are the words that describe them and we have spoke of them and preached them, all of this is happening in real time. So try to put your mind there. Try to let this video help you to get to that place and then maybe ask the Lord to open your ears and help you to hear this with a different way of hearing. Verse 18 says, This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged. Now that word is betrothed, okay? This is a word that's most like our word engagement. How many of you know what it is to be engaged? Okay, we know what that is. But we pretty much design and pick that. But that's not how it is in Jewish culture. In fact, it is most probably a relationship between Mary and Joseph that was arranged when they were small children by their parents. Now, you know, I know that teenagers, and when I first heard that, I thought, yuck, how does that happen? I don't want my parents having something to say about who I date. I'm going to tell you what, the divorce rate would be much lower and our marriages would be much greater if we had parents way ahead making decisions. And whether you like it or not, history has proven that to be oh so true. But that's not how it is for us. So we need to understand how it is in Scripture. The parents, when they're children, arrange the marriage. It's a contract. It's written out. But then... One year before they actually marry and become legally husband and wife, they go through a period of call, called betrothal. Now, this is just as legal as a marriage. In fact, the contract and the covenant can only be broken by divorce. In fact, if a woman loses her betrothed, she is called a widow of betrothal. She's treated in exactly the same way. Would have all the rights and privileges under uh, Jewish law because it was that legal. So they're in this period 
And of course, you know the story from Luke, and we've looked at that, and it's where Mary, of course, uh, is informed by the angel about this supernatural creation of a birth inside of her. I want to remind you that what is done in Mary is done by the Holy Spirit. It is not physical, it is spiritual. It is a creative act of God just as the creative act of God is in the creation of the world and of you and of me. But it's directly by the hand of God. So Joseph, though he is the legal father, he is not the biological father. In fact, if you go and you read these begats, he is never seen. He is seen simply as the husband of Mary. Because the word father in the text means to give seed, which means it comes from their bloodline. Now, here we are in the midst of the story, and Mary has gone through this creative work of God in her, and I don't know how long. (laughs) Uh, Maybe he just thought she was putting on weight. You know, I'm not real sure how he came to determine that she was, in fact, pregnant. But as that became obvious, and the fatherhood was not his, was obvious, is where you're found in this verse that Mary, who was pledged to Joseph, but before they became, they came together. We don't know when that happens. It, it seems as though, you know, there's this time when both of them know at the same time. You know, God tells them both. It kind of sounds like, but the text deliberately says that's not so. He comes to know it, you know, over a period of time. Uh, you know, that's, that's sometimes tough, isn't it? So he's already been through a lot of questioning, a lot of doubting, a lot of wondering. And it says, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful, or he was a person of the law, or that he was righteous. There are many adjectives, different translations used here as her husband. Uh, He did not want to expose her to public disgrace. And he had in mind, as we just talked about in the betrothal, to divorce her. Now, that was going to be real fragile too because if he didn't want her to be publicly disgraced and he didn't want her to have some other things that occur, uh, but he wanted this protected, that would mean he'd have to get at least two witnesses and make a legal effort to divorce her during the betrothal. And those folks would have to keep it quiet. Can you imagine the anxiety that's already on his shoulders? Now, while all of this thinking is going on, while all of this is a part of his thinking, and listen to how the Scripture says it, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her public and make it a public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. All this is going on in his thinking about how he's going to handle this. And then verse 20. But after he had considered what? All that I've just been talking about. After he had considered this. The antecedent of the pronoun is is all that information. After he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him. Now, I know in the plays they make the angel Gabriel probably the best guess. But it doesn't tell us. It just says an angel. An angel of the Lord here. Uh, appears to him in a dream. How many of you have ever had vivid dreams? You know, when I have a vivid dream and I don't like what I dream, and I wake up, I've contributed to something I ate the night before that probably made me dream such a crazy dream. I might even call that a nightmare. And I think maybe (laughs) Joseph might have called it a nightmare up front if he had had the opportunity, but notice what happens. He has a dream, and in that dream, an angel comes to him, and he says to him, Joseph, son of David, notice this is Matthew 
writing to a Jewish audience, confirming the legal pedigree of Jesus. Not the biological. Because, you know, his birth line from David had a king in it that was prophesied to never have a person sit on the throne. But it isn't the biological son of Joseph. It's the legal son of Joseph. But it's the biological child of Mary. So that enables Jesus to be enthroned as king of kings and lord of lords. Just some things that are in there that we don't look at. You know, but they're there. They're a part of the story. And Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will give him the name Yahshua. In the Old Testament, we call that who? Joshua. And brought into the New Testament, it's Jesus, but it actually means God is our salvation. Now, don't get carried away with words like that because they use those kind of words always for kings and people that had leaderships and almighty Lord and they, they give them, they, those names were common. And so he is the one who brings salvation. But it's because he will save his people from their sin. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. Now, kind of hold on right there, put your finger in, and jump over with me to the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah, you'll find it in chapter 7 and in verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Now, if you're not careful, you'll think that the you is you and me. You'll think the you is all audience. But actually, Isaiah is addressing Ahaz, a king of his own day. And there is a birth by a woman who is legally able to have children, and it is supernatural, but it isn't a virgin birth. And so he uses a different word, a woman who is legally able to be married. So kind of hang on to that because that's one word in the Hebrew. And I'm going to give you some clarification here of why that's important. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which is God with us. And we go back to our text and we find those words. The virgin will conceive. Now, the difference is when you go from the Hebrew in the Old Testament to the Greek in the New Testament, the word there is the unique word for a virgin, a woman that's never known a man, as opposed to a woman who is of legal marrying age. And I think that's really significant in the text, and we need to know that because this is a supernatural creation of God. It is unique. It's never happened before. It has never happened since. This was the hand of God. In fact, it's so important that in our theology, we call Jesus, what, the second Adam because the first one was created by the hand of God and this one is created by the hand of God as God takes off his divinity and is clothed incarnation in our humanity. These are very important things. That's why that hymn is so important because it lifts up all of these attributes about who and what Christ is. Now, when we get to verse 24, it says, when jo Joseph woke up, real time, I don't know how many of you have this. Ron, I don't know if this happens to you and your bride. I know it happens to me and mine. I, Kathy will wake up and say, man, I had a bad dream last night. But sometimes, depending on how bad the dream is, uh, she either will or won't tell me. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I usually wake up and say, man, I had the weirdest dream last night. But, you know, there was something 
different about this dream. There's something not only with Joseph, but something in Joseph's understanding of Holy Scriptures. There's something that makes this kind of a dream, this dream, uniquely different. And when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. He took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Pray with me. Father, this morning we thank you for your word. Help us to understand how you go to the least of these, how you go to what often seems to us when you speak to us as people that are radically underqualified and clueless about how you could accomplish what we believe you spoke to us. And yet, God, you're able to. If we can set aside our doubt and our fear and trust you, there's nothing that you can't do that you call us to. In fact, you will give us everything we need to accomplish it. Father, help us to embrace it with trust and belief in you and watch you unfold the marvelous mystery in our life that in the end brings you glory. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, as we look at Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus, we begin by looking at the fact that this story begins in the land of promise, not the promised land, but in that place where God gives a promise. And as we look at that, we first look at the prophecy out of Isaiah, and we find out that that's exactly what God is about to do. He has used an angel to speak to Mary. He sends Mary to see Elizabeth, whose husband's been spoken to by an angel. You know, angels have this kind of mystical way of announcing for God, God's plan and purpose in people's lives. And that's what's going on here. Just like when Abraham and Sarah are told about the fact you're going to have a child. Now, is that miraculous? Yes, they were both beyond the age of childbearing. He was over 100 years old, and she was 99. We got any folks in here 99? I don't believe we got a single person in here 99 years old. In fact, it might take three or four of us to eat mad up to 99. And yet, he's, Abraham's even older, and, and yet the angel has to come. You remember? And the day that the angel comes... Uh, the mother, Sarah's listening behind the curtain. And what does she do when she hears the angel says, when we come back this time next year, you're going to have a baby? Anybody remember? She laughed. She snickered behind the curtain. And does God have a sense of humor or what? Name him Isaac, which means what? Laughter. <laughs> she would never forget not only her doubt, but God's blessing. And on those types of things go even right up until the very birth of Jesus. So in the New Testament, on the other side of the issue, we have a person who also is beyond bearing children, whose husband is actually doing the duties of the temple, and the angel says, you're going to have a child. And because he doesn't believe the angel... Y'all know what I'm talking about? See, you don't have to say it. You know, he got muted. Y'all have a mute button anywhere or anything you use? It muted him. And, and, and until the baby was born, and it was eight days later when the baby was going to be named, did they turn and say, what's the baby's name going to be? They were looking for something. And when he went to do that, he says, his name will be John. <laughs> I don't know who was the most surprised, people or him. And out came the name. Well, there's something wrapped up in that. And so there's this prophecy that it comes to the parents and they're aware of their history. But in the midst of this, it's, like I said, real time. It's real time. And so there's this conundrum going on. There's three possibilities for Joseph. 
One, according to Leviticus, he can have her stoned. That doesn't mean guys taking drugs. It means like killing people by piling stones on top of them. For adults, that's not pelting. That's Arabic, Jewish belief in the protection of the body, physical body. They stretched them out, put a huge boulder on their chest, and then piled stones on top of them. They're not throwing stones at them. They die or are supposed to die from suffocation. That's how Paul lived. He didn't suffocate. And somebody came and took the stones off of him and he was still alive. And so that was one death. Death was one option. The second option was disgrace. Taking her to the city gate and talking about all the bad stuff that's been done to him because of this woman. It kind of looks like the woman caught in adultery and how they treated her. Public disgrace. And the third was to divorce her. And he couldn't have done that publicly or like he chose and was thinking he was going to do privately. But why he's thinking about all this. And so my next point is to ponder. Now that this is why. I notice in the text what it says. It says, because of all these things about his person and his character, which made him a unique, compassionate, and caring person, kind of like what our Joseph in the clip said he believed Joseph was like. It says, but after he had considered this, all these things, these options, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Why he's trying to decide what to do. I mean, it, it didn't just happen like, like that didn't happen like the snapping of your fingers. I used to snap my fingers, folks, till I got arthritis in this one, and it just won't work anymore. Do you ever lose your snap? I'm losing some of my snap. <laughs> but it was just like that, just like the snapping of a finger that works. No, it wasn't that way. He's thinking about it. He's going over it, and then all of a sudden, that night while he's asleep and all this is on his mind and he's trying to figure out what in the world he's going to do, God comes and speaks to him. Wow, isn't that great? God comes and speaks to him. Well, the scripture says that in the midst of while this was happening, he was pondering this. He was a man of the law. What should I do according to the law? He's a man of love. I care about Mary. I have compassion for her. I don't want to disgrace her. I don't want all this dismissal. How am I going to deal with this? Well, you know, it didn't like God when you come to the end of yourself to always have an option you didn't think of. And that's exactly what happens here. God got an option for Joseph that he hadn't thought of. But it isn't always an easy option. And it certainly isn't always the one that you would choose to take yourself. But somehow, based on his background, based on his walk and relationship with God, based on his understanding of Jewish history, there's something there that's like the experience with the angel in the dream that make them lock together, and he knows they're from the same source. Now, I don't know how to tell you how you know that, but you do and you can know that. People ask me, Pastor, how do you know you were called? Because my call from God was just like when God came in and saved my soul. The experiences were almost identical as far as how I received the dynamic of God's relating to me. That's how I knew they were alike and they were from the same place. God had saved me. He had, in the history of my life, proven himself to that salvation real and now he's asking me to take another step and based on what I previously have known I know I have a choice to trust him and take the one that I took which was to follow and go prayer prayer and become a pastor now I want to tell you right now if you've heard bad sermons from me you've got bad counsel from me or I haven't uh, done for you what you think of that is not God's fault that's my fault <laughs> Uh, but when God is in it and he has a hold of me and of the words I say, he speaks through that and he ministers to people. But that's not me, that's God. God's in it when you trust him. And I'm hoping that he's in this word this morning as you hear it. For as he ponders both the law and the love, this powerful occurrence takes place. And in the, mid and in the mystery of both Old Testament and possibly he even already knew from Mary in the New Testament about John the Baptist. Well, he couldn't because he didn't know she was pregnant. See? He won't find this out till later. But all these things help to confirm that God does keep his promise. 
I want to tell you something. God never lies. And he always does exactly what he says he's going to do. And I'm going to tell you something else that I have learned. If he calls you to do something, he will always give you what you need to get it done. And even if you may fail along the way and drop the ball along the way, which I think most all of us do it in process, he never gives up on you, even when you give up on yourself. So here it is, God's protection. In the doubt, who's the father? How can this be? We've loved each other all these years. We've looked forward to this all of our life. How could this, why? Why would Mary do this? And what in the world am I going to do? In the midst of his doubt, in the midst of his fear, he knew the cutting gossip that was going to come. He knew the accusations that would be made. He knew the ridicule that they would receive. In fact, it's most probable that's why they moved to Nazareth or up into Galilee in that area to just get away from it. And then, instead of the doubt, instead of the fear that was plaguing him, he chose to trust. Let the shepherd carry you. Do y'all remember that from last week's clip where he reached down and picked that old dog up, big old dog that had the thing up that he's supposed to be one of the animals in the nativity scene. And he said, come on, let the shepherd carry you. How many of you today maybe need to let the shepherd carry you? Because he will. He certainly will. Let the shepherd carry you. Three actions that shows that Joseph did this. He did exactly what the angel said. He took Mary as his wife. And he did not consummate the marriage until Jesus was born. Three decisive actions that showed obedience and belief in what God had shown him. Now the great thing about the promise of God, when you fall under his hand of protection is that God has a plan that he always keeps with you in order to bring it about. We flip over into the second chapter. The Magi have come, and after they've come and they've warned them about Herod's intention to kill the baby, the first appearance comes again. It's just like the one that he had. He said, get up, take the baby, go down into Egypt. And he does that. And after he's there a while and Herod dies and Archelaus comes in and takes his place, uh, his brother, he starts back, but he's kind of fearful of the brother and what the brother might do. So he gets another word and he says, now don't go home to Israel, go to... So he goes and he makes his home in Nazareth. And guess what that does? It fulfills exactly what God said. He'll be called a what? Nazarene. Because he's from Nazareth. And of course, what was the ridicule? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? You know, it wasn't the greatest place in the world to live, but it was a safe place. And Joseph made a life and living for them there, and our Lord was raised there. So, the earthly father of Jesus, is it worth listening to God when he speaks to you and to me? I would say yes. You say, Pastor, did you have doubts? Oh, yes. Were you afraid? No, I was terrified. But somehow, God gave me enough grace to trust him. And he's done more in my life than I would have ever dreamed of possible. And I'm going to tell you something. I went back to do this funeral yesterday in Birmingham, and people just came up to me with this dumbfoundedness, you know. They couldn't believe that was the Greg George they grew up with. How could you ever be like this and do... You know what? It reminded me of how far God has brought me. And God continues to take me and take you. If we'll set aside that fear and doubt and trust Him. And so what did it do for Joseph? Oh, folks, let me tell you what. He was the first one to hold in his hands the Lord Jesus Christ on this earth. He took 
Jesus from the wound of Mary at the pregnancy and delivery and held the Lord of all creation in his hands. Now, I don't think that's going to be for all of us by any means, but what does God have for you? And what does God have for me if we'll just trust him? If we'll just trust him. Well, God wants to bring glory to himself by your decision and mine. That heavy weightedness that comes when he's present in your life and mine that makes everybody around know God's here. God's here. You ever had that happen to you? Remember the first time vividly it happened to me? I was about 19. I was standing in the back of a roadway trailer at 3 something in the morning. And I had one foot up against the trailer. And I was leaning back, waiting on, we called it the tow motor. That's what they called it at that time. It was a forklift, of course. And I was waiting for them to come and unload. And I fell asleep standing up against the side of the truck. And the guy pulls up on the forklift and beats a horn, which, you know, that pretty much got me wide awake real quick. And then he said something I wasn't ready for. He said, you're a Christian, aren't you? And I thought, what? I'm the one that just fell asleep on work. <laughs> standing here in the truck. He said, you're a Christian, aren't you? And I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, I could tell. Well, oh, that wasn't me. That was God in me. The glory of Christmas. Glory to the newborn king. Folks, we have a wonderful Savior who wants to come and live inside of us and make us more than we ever dreamed we could be if we'll put our faith and trust in him. And the end result is to bring glory to God. People will know he's here and present because you and I have trusted him and allowed him to work in us even though we are radically underqualified. Would you be willing to do that today? Young people, would you be willing to do that and let God have your life? Young adults, older adults, God doesn't quit. There's no amount of mistakes that can ever keep God from working in your life. So I'm encouraging you today as we study about Joseph to let God set his glory off in you. This Christmas, each of us are asked to deal with our fear and our doubt and to trust God and allow him to use us to produce the glory of Christmas each and every day of our lives. Would you pray with me? Father, we realize that when we give our heart and life to you, that you come in and transform us and make us into the very thing you created us to be. And when we're willing to live in such a way, that brings glory to you. I pray that every man, every woman, every boy, every child that has heard this will first come to know you as Lord and Savior, and second, allow you to transition beyond their fear and doubt and see that trust transformed into the glory of Christmas. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us. We look forward to you being with us again next week.